at urinary incontinence. And for us to understand this, we have to basically understand the location of the bladder together with how maturation occurs. So in a nutshell, basically the bladder is the uh, sac, the neuromuscular sac that temporarily holds the uh, urine. And it is just located uh, in between the ureters and the urethra. So the neuromuscular sac um, gets innovation from um, different uh, nerves that emanate from the spinal cord. And also they get um, innovation from the pontine centers. So that controls how the, uh, the muscles contract, especially this detrusor muscle. And then it also um, controls how the internal sphincter and the external sphincter relaxes or contracts, therefore releasing urine. Now, incontinence by itself is basically the inability to control the passage of urine. So if you cannot control how we release or how we hold urine, then that leads to uh, the condition we call urinary incontinence. So it is basically the involuntary loss of bladder control. Um, ordinarily, we have control of when we want to empty our bladder or not. So when we lose that ability, then we become, uh, we, we have urinary incontinence. So this can uh, be just a small leakage or it can end up being total lack of ability to hold any sort of urine. So, but this is a bit different for children. Um, they are not considered to have incontinence until uh, some, some age um, that they're actually regarded to have some sort of training. So before that, they are just merely regarded of, as uh, having been untrained. So in terms of um, epidemiology, the incontinence is mostly common in the elderly population, as you can see here. And um, among the different gender, women are more likely to basically have urinary incontinence, owing largely to the fact that the, the anatomy of the urinary tract is um, uh, a bit different from how the, the male one is, and it is congested within the pelvic region. So it predisposes them to having um, this kind of problem. So there's so many risk factors that can lead to incontinence. Just to mention a few, um, use of some substances like alcohol or caffeine. Um, if you have um, some mental confusion or depression, UTIs, weight gain, all the way up to uh, having some sort of enlargement, prostate enlargement in men or in a case of cancer. There are also some medical conditions like Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, especially the nervous system disorders can lead to this problem. Um, UTIs also can lead to, can put you at risk of actually having the condition as well as um, um, if you have increased urine output in cases where you have uncontrolled diabetes. There are some states, not condition, they're just states like um, when somebody has a gravid uterus or when they're pregnant, those are some situations where one actually can end up having um, urinary incontinence. So just to now look at them specifically and, and, and class them to make them easy for understanding, we can basically classify incontinence into stress, incontinence, urge, incontinence, overflow, reflex, and functional incontinence. So we start with the first one, which is stress incontinence. And as the name suggests, we are putting stress or pressure on the bladder. So the, as a result, we end up having um, loss of urine during this action of pressure or stress. So some of these actions may include things like sneezing or lifting um, or coughing. Or sometimes um, when women are pregnant, the pregnancy uh, puts pressure or the gravid uterus puts pressure on the bladder. So if you remove um, this um, external pressure or stress, then chances are that we will regain um, the ability to, con to control our bladder. So it is simply because of the external pressure that is being put on the bladder. Now, the other one is urge incontinence. And this is basically where we have uncontrollable involuntary urge uh, to urinate. And this occurs especially at the point of the bladder, basically. So the bladder is, contr uh, is contracting in an uncontrollable, um, unsynchronized manner. And as a result, you end up just having the urge to um, release urine. So um, sometimes this is um, regarded to as overreactive bladder when we don't know the exact cause. 
So this has been linked to so many things, but one prominent one is the, when you have some sort of infection, this can actually lead to irritation of the bladder, and then you have some um, overreactive bladder. The other one is overflow incontinence. Uh, as the name suggests, uh, we end up having incontinence just because the bladder is so full that now there's nowhere the, the urine can go to. So it has now to start seeping out by force. So this normally occurs when you have some sort of obstruction that uh, maybe will lead to um, uh, um, the bladder filling up or if you also have some nerve damage to the point that it cannot perceive that actually you are having excess amount of urine. So as a result of the bladder becoming so full, then it overflows. The overflow now starts dribbling out. And one of the main features of overflow incontinence is dribbling of urine. Then the other one, which is highly um, related to the urge incontinence is the reflex incontinence, where basically you have loss of uh, ability to control um, your bladder just because of hyperreflexia. And this occurs from uh, the abnormal sensation of the micturation uh, cycle, basically. So uh, this will occur in patients with spinal cord injuries uh, because they are they now um, they have their neurologically mediated motor control of the detrusor uh, and also the sensory awareness of the need to avoid. So that that interplay between the, 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 the bladder knowing when to contract and as a result of the increase in the amount of urine is lost, uh, therefore we actually end up having hyperreflexia. So we keep on uh, uh, pushing and pushing and pushing the bladder to actually remove the urine. So the, fun the, the, the functional incontinence is the last one we'll talk about. It is not, we have so many other types, but functional incontinence is also one of them. So this normally occurs in the older population. And uh, this simply occurs as a result of a physical or mental impairment that basically hinders one from um, getting to the toilet in time. Um, and as a result, we end up actually um, um, urinating on ourselves. So for example, a person with uh, severe arthritis, they, they may not be able to unbutton the, their pants very fast. And consequently, they actually um, mess themselves or they may not be able to walk very fast and get to the, uh, to the loo so that they can relieve themselves. So these are just sort of, we've talked about stress, there's too little tone on them. Um, there's too little tone, especially on the on the sphincters. But we are getting a lot of uh, external pressure. Then urge. There's too much activity of the bladder, especially the detrusor muscle. In mixed, you can have a combination of the two. In overflow, the um, the tone is there, but the the problem is that we're having overflow or excess levels of the urine. Okay, so there is another one which we call iatrogenic. This now will not come um, if we are having other extrinsic medical factors or predominantly medication. So, for example, if you're using um, <clears throat> some uh, <clears throat> some agents like alpha adrenergic agents, this um, will actually end up affecting um, the bladder. Okay, and basically how relaxation happens, uh, the sphincter levels. So this this iatrogenic incontinence occurs as a result of use of medication and other medical conditions. So when they are taken out or when they are discontinued, then we regain our we regain our ability to control urine. So mixed is a combination, like for example, stress and urge incontinence. So when they are occurring together, that's mixed incontinence. So patients with this uh, incontinence will most of the time have a smell of urine and the soiling of the undergarments, irritation of the perineal area because it's always wet. And because of that, they will have, uh, they will not feel like they fit in the social um, uh, limelight. So therefore they will want to seclude themselves. They will be angry. And if they engage in any physical activity that put, it, put some pressure on their abdomen, then they most of the time end up urinating. So, the assessment mostly 
that is done for this is urine and urine culture to rule out things like UTIs, residual urine measurement, which is very important, together with the urodynamic studies, serum electrolyte levels, and then imaging just to look at um, how the bladder is. Um, then vaginal and rectal examination, this is to rule out things, for example, like um, uh, an enlarged prostate for men. Uh, in the case of um, the rectum for vaginal, they might want to actually look if we have any other condition that might be predisposing one to having this kind of incontinence. Then management depends basically on what is the cause. Um, urinary incontinence may either be lasting for a few a, a few days of some like when when we have transient or reversible. But sometimes you have a condition where that now it is there to to stay. It's very hard to revert. So that one now will need to have other kind of management um, uh, ways, like things like catheters and other ways of actually holding on to the urine. So the, we can have behavioral technique, drug therapy, medical devices that are used or surgical intervention. So behavioral techniques include uh, like having bladder drills, Kegel tests, uh, Kegel exercises, and having fluid and diet management. And, and also scheduling uh, your toilet trips. For drug therapy, we use of anticholinergic agents, which basically inhibit bladder contraction. And as a result, they will reduce the incontinence or the urine that it passes. Other drugs like antispasmodic, use of estrogen, and uh, some antidepressants together with alpha adrenergic blockers. There's some medical devices that are used to block uh, the path. So like there's some pessaries that are used um, and then they block from the point of the vagina to um, uh, indirectly onto, onto the sphincter. Then catheters together with clamps and also urethral inserts. Now surgical intervention may include things like using a bladder neck suspension, a bladder augmentation, and also artificial urinary sphincter so that we end up having 